1936, I was just a young man, only 30 years, and secretary of the largest and oldest Pentecostal movement in South Africa. It began in 1908 when two Americans came over there, John Lake and Tom Hirschmiller, and they began meetings in Johannesburg and uh, with the old Zion people. Dowieites, they call them sometimes. Zion had healing, uh, divine healing. Dowie was very wonderful, but he objected to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. These were elders from Zion that had received the baptism, and so there were some Zion people there. They came together, and in that old Presbyterian church that could seat about 600, they had 18 months of revival every night of the year. Never a night without a meeting. And the weekends usually began Friday night, all through the night, all through Saturday, all through Saturday night, all through Sunday till Monday midnight. And then they go and have a little sleep before they go to work on Monday morning. Every weekend, miracles and miracles. Well, now this movement had grown amongst white and black throughout the country, and I became general secretary in 1932. And uh, then, Brother Smith Wigglesworth, we thought it'd be wonderful to have him in South Africa. We heard of all the wonderful things God did through him, but he was not a great educated, learned theologian. He just was a simple believer. In fact, Brother Wigglesworth never wrote a line in his whole life. He could only sign his name. His wife taught him how to do that. He never could read. Uh, he never went to school. He started working when he was a young boy, but he he was a plumber, we call him now. And he uh, came to the Lord and wanted to read the New Testament. And so he sat and read, and, or rather tried, and his wife helped him a little. And one day, all of a sudden, he could read the New Testament. He said, God taught me how. Now I met other people that had been the same. I knew a Russian a lady here in America that couldn't read English, and the Lord taught her how to read English. She could read Russian, but he could read nothing. And so when I met him, he told me that he never, never reads anything, no pamphlet, nothing he ever tries to read, only the Word of God. And he says, the New Testament, I think I know from Matthew to Revelation, and I could quote it and wouldn't make a mistake in the punctuation. He had memorized the whole New Testament. He could quote you chapter after chapter. So, he came to South Africa, had great meetings. Because I arranged all of his meetings throughout the country as General Secretary and so on, we became very close friends. And when he came to Johannesburg to work in that area, now the Rand, we call it, is uh, an area where you have a couple of million people uh, from Pretoria, from Johannesburg Center to Pretoria Center, about 36 miles down to Bray, anything another 36 miles, out towards Rand, Rundfontein, another 36 miles. And so you have, in that area of 50 miles, you have I would say now perhaps three million people. He was having meetings in that area. So we decided he would stay with us in our home. We had a large home. Now the reason for the large home wasn't that we had such a large family, but my wife found it convenient to keep some borders and uh, help in that way to keep the faith life going. And so we didn't have borders and we had lots of room. One morning early, now at, uh, when he came, my wife was a little worried about this strange old gentleman, because if you ever saw him in action, there was nobody 
be that I have met that have ever tried to imitate Wigglesworth. Uh, they may have tried to imitate a lot of others, but they never could imitate him. What's more, if he couldn't find a word, he made one. <laughs> and he made words that you couldn't find in any dictionary in the world. <laughs> but somehow he understood it. And what he liked about me is I always understood him. And so I made a good interpreter for him. He had to preach English and I'd interpret him to Afrikaans. He stayed with us and found him to be the finest old gentleman to entertain. He didn't eat very much, but he told you what he'd eat and so on, and he was very nice about it, and he'd get finished quickly, and then he says, well, uh, you can't be eating, uh, feeding your body only, let's feed your soul. So he would stop quoting scripture. Right at the table. Before you finish your meal, you've got a sermon for dessert. <laughs> he was really splendid that way, shared so easily with you. He one day said to me, Brother, he says, if anybody ever can catch me without a testament on my body, I'll give him five pounds. I said, well, you always have a testament on your body? He said, yes. I said, uh, how about when you take a shower? <laughs> he says, then I'll lock the door. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that I couldn't catch him without a way on his body. He carried a testament. And this is what I like. He had a testament like this, you know, pocket testament, with a nice and flat. And I decided that someday I'll get me one like that. And I think I've got a half a dozen of them now. But I use one at a time. And uh, he would always have that testament and always speak from it. And he believed the word of God. He was really an apostle of faith. Very simple faith. And he would preach. Now there's a book, Ever Increasing Faith, which may be out of print, but I don't see it here. But if you can get a hold of Ever Increasing Faith, that will increase your faith. Besides being known as a wonderful evangelist with a mighty healing miracle, I must say I have been with healers since then. I have seen uh, Brother Branham in action. I've seen the Jeffreys in England in action and others in England. I saw Brother Branham and was with him for a while. And uh, Tommy Osborne, Tommy Hicks, and uh, uh, who else have you? I worked with, far, with the uh, Voice of Healing, and I knew some 70 healing evangelists, good, bad, and indifferent. All kinds. <laughs> and <laughs> I know all about it. But not one have I seen ever had the ministry that Wigglesworth had. And so everybody was interested in this strange old gentleman who knew so much, even though he had learned so little, from the world. But you see, his gospel was unadulterated. You didn't get him to quote what anybody said because he never read what anybody said for what the Lord said. It's a temptation to quote these other things, you know. Anyhow, one morning, early, he walked into the kitchen, unannounced, just stepped in and he looked around, and there was busy cooking. Where's David? She said, Brother Wigglesworth, he's gone to the office already. And this was six o'clock. You see, I get up at five, and then get ready by six o'clock. I'm going to the office from six to nine. I dictate all my letters and so on. Nine o'clock, the girls come in. They've got everything on record and they can go on with their work and I can go on with counseling and consultations and so on. And uh, that's the way I had regulated my life. So I was in the office. He just turned around and shouted down the passage to his son-in-law, Jimmy Salter. Jimmy! And Jimmy woke up and came out and said, Yes, Dad. He says, Where's Compton? Compton was driving the car for them. And he said, uh, Oh, he's asleep. He says, Wake him up. I must see David at once. And so, in a little while, the car left. I was 12 miles from the office where we lived. 
As I sat in that office, the door suddenly flew open. I didn't hear anybody's footsteps. All of a sudden, that door just opened <coughs> almost with a bang. And there stood Brother Wailsworth, and he walked forward, stood up straight, and commanded me, he says, Get up from there. Come out of there. And I stood up and meekly came over to him. And he put his hands on my shoulders and pushed me up against the wall. <laughs> and looked straight in my eyes and began to prophesy. The first words I'll never forget, he says, The Lord says, you have been in your Jerusalem long enough. You have to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he is going to send you. I enjoyed Brother Cornwall this morning because what he said was so true. There's a lot of things the Lord will say to you now as if it is, and it's only his intentions to make it so. And he began to prophesy things that I knew. I didn't believe, I didn't want, and I didn't expect to get completely out of my reach and out of my field, out of my vision. I had a vision for a Pentecostal movement. I had a vision for a Pentecostal movement that will sweep the world. But what I mean is out of the churches, separate from the churches, a new church, really, that will sweep the world. And here he began to prophesy that I would travel more than most men travel in their lives. He said, and you will have the privilege to see and to participate in the most glorious and mightiest sweeping revival that ever has been known in Christian history. Mm -hmm. It will come through the old line denominations. That's what he called them then. We call them now the historic churches. They call us classic Pentecostals. <laughs> we are classic already. We're so old. We need renewal. Well, he said, it is coming in a remarkable way. Ministers will accept the truth and accept the baptism and the churches will begin to accept this glorious endowment. He prophesied and made no distinctions about any churches. But what he said, really, when he said it, I thought, well, we haven't even got what he's talking about. We haven't got that in our action in our uh, movement and we are praying for something like that but we want it for ourselves you know to show the other fellows here he says it will come to the other fellows and I'll have a part in it well he went on and prophesied until finally he said it's no use I can't tell you anymore because there are some things that even I don't understand and I don't know how to explain them to you. I am telling you visions. So it appeared that from two to four in the morning he had seen visions of this revival that God was sent. <laughs> and after he had prophesied and given unburdened his heart, he just bowed his head and said, Lord, bless me. And left me and walked out. Closed the door. I could, he didn't discuss it with me. So I went and sat down at the desk and leaned my head on my hands and I began to talk and say, Lord, I accept the warning, but if this is going to happen, I will need to be guided of you very, very much. I cannot go by what others say. Woe be tied unto the man who gets his life directed by some prophet or prophetess. Amen. The guy lives in you. Amen. And because he dwells in us, 
New Testament prophecy is not like Old Testament prophecy. For in the Old Testament, the Spirit moved upon the prophet to speak to the people, but there was no Spirit in the people. They just had to listen to the Word. But today, the church is a body born of the Spirit, and the Spirit is in them. You don't talk to them like people who don't know the Spirit. That's why every one of us has got to know guidance from the Lord. We've got to know. Well, I don't know how long I sat there rather puzzled when there was a gentle knock at the door. And I shouted, Come in! And the door opened, and there stood Smith Wigglesworth again. Good morning, brother. Then he greeted me. First time he didn't greet me at all. Just ordered me. Come on, man. No greetings. No asking how are you. He didn't come gently. Now he's very gentle and says, How are you? I said, Well, the wheels were greatly puzzled. He said, Why? I said, Because you have been in here. You talked to me. You prophesied. You told me vision. And now you come in and greet me as if you never saw me. He said, but the Bible does say, the Lord said to the prophet, greet no man on the way. I said, yes. <laughs> he says, I didn't greet your wife, I didn't greet Salter, I didn't greet Crompton, I didn't greet you until I delivered the message. But now the prophet has delivered the message, and that's why I've come back to discuss it with you. <laughs> what do you think of it? I said, Brother Wigglesworth, I am really amazed. And I just want to ask you, have you got scripture for such a thing? I always like to ask for scripture. For when it, when I can say it is written, then I have faith. He said, yes, I have scripture. The Lord told me what scripture to give you. Acts 6 and 7. The word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. That's a description of the first Pentecostal church, of the beginning of the church. And then afterwards, after the church had so flourished, a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. And he said, this is what the Lord wants me to explain to you. First, it's a layman's movement, a fisherman's movement. But the second wave that comes becomes a clergy, priesthood movement. And after the, the work has been thoroughly established by the Holy Spirit, in the laity, and God had proved himself, then some priests will come in, and there will be a great, tremendous move because of the priests or the ministers. He explained to me then, he said to me, I wish I was younger, for according to what the Lord said to me, you will see this great change and this great move of the Spirit come around about the middle of the century. That's 14 years later, 1936, about 15 years longer. Then I will see it. Well, the Lord took a long time to warn me, didn't he? 15 years. And I never forgot what he said. He said then, remember also this, you don't have to worry about doing anything at all or seeing much of it until I'm gone home. For the Lord made it very clear to me that I must not preach this and I must not attempt to stop anything. I must leave it. He will work it out. But it will not even begin while I'm alive, so I won't even see the beginnings of it. 
That's why I wish I was 20 years younger, so that I could see these beginnings. But you will see them. And he said, now a word of warning. God said, all the things that I have told you already will come to pass, and you will see them, and you will have a part in them, with only this condition, that you remain humble and faithful. If you can remember those two things, remain humble and faithful, then God will use you in a way that no one else is used, unusual. It will not be the trend. It'll be you and God. And you must keep humble and remain faithful. I can see today, if you're blessed, succeed, then there is the danger of getting puffed up and being proud as your achievement. Faithful, there is the danger that you may compromise. I'm glad for what Brother Spencer told you, for I haven't yet found a Pentecostal brother that came to hear what I said to these people that did not admit that I was not compromising. I never apologized for Pentecost. That's why they call me Mr. Pentecost. I refuse to be anything but Pentecostal. I'm not a Protestant. I'm not evangelical. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm all that plus. Pentecost. Don't ever stop fundamentalism. Don't stop being uh, at being evangelical. There is more. Always more. And this I learned from a man that some might even think was not such a dedicated Christian, but I knew him as a very dedicated Christian. Karl Barth said to me, the biggest mistake you could ever make was to think you've arrived and stop going on. He said, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the light. Now he says, he is a way without a terminal. There's no end. You never arrive at the end until you're in glory. And that's not the end yet. He says, and as you move on in the way, the truth will dawn on you. You can't see the truth now that you will see as you move on along the way. No more than you can see what's beyond the hills. And then he says, as the truth dawns on you, the light grows brighter and brighter. But you've got to keep going. Well, I am with you. Oh, Brother Wigglesworth said to me, Have you, uh, do you ever get air sick? I said, Sir, I've never been in the air. He says, Do you get seasick? I said, Never been in the sea. I've never traveled. I travel in my own country in South Africa. I've been up and down, uh, crisscross that country. I knew every town and city in the country. <laughs> and uh, I knew the work. The Pentecostal work, every Pentecostal movement that worked there, missionaries and so on. But I'd never been out on the sea. I had never been in the air. Those days you didn't fly so easy. He said, Well, you're going to fly a lot and you will travel, as he repeated, more than most men. And you must not get sick. Come here. <laughs> out I came again pushed me up against the wall, and now I think he finished his job. He prayed that I should never get sick when I travel for the Lord. <laughs> he told the Lord, he said, Lord, you know, it's awful to be sick at home, but it's ten times worse to be sick away from home. <laughs> so don't let him ever get sick when he's working or traveling for you. And thank the Lord, I haven't got I'm always well when I travel. 
If I'm tired at home, I get traveling time. <laughs> and I work hard at home. When I'm traveling, I don't work so hard because I get a little more time to rest and more relax. But when I'm home, I work against time, uh, writing, correspondence, and now lately, with my hand, I've <laughs> been doing carpentry, which I haven't done for years. And I, Good exercise, too. My Lord was also a carpenter, you know. And uh, in the, at the carpenter's bench down in my office, my wife put a little picture of Jesus working in the carpenter shop. And when I work around there, uh, I'm still working for him. I still think of him, wonderful Jesus. And so, I didn't see Brother Wigglesworth. Oh, by the way, no, I didn't see him after this prophecy. He left there and went down to Cape Town for meetings. I had to follow him to Cape Town to help some big meetings we had there. And when I came, before I left for Cape Town, I got a, le a letter from J. Roswell Flower, General Secretary of the Assemblies of God, in the past on to be with the Lord, July 23, just a few days ago. He was 82 then. He was the general secretary over here. I get a lovely letter from him inviting me to come to the United States in 1937 and be one of the speakers at general council at Memphis, Tennessee. I came over in 37 and then went back by England in 38. Saw Brother Wigglesworth again. And he then, I stayed with him this time in 70 Victor Road, Bradford. He lived in 70 Victor Road from the day he got married. His wife passed away in that house. He passed away in that house. His daughter, Mrs. Salter, passed away in that house. And if Jimmy is still alive, he'll pass away in that house. They never bought it. They rented it. Still paying the rent. I think they've paid for it over and over and over again in all these years. <laughs> Seventy Victor Road, that's where I met him. And as we there discuss things, things are beginning to happen. It looked like war. Sure enough, I found soldiers everywhere in Europe. And I made for home. I didn't want to be in Europe when trouble was. It was Hitler's days. And everybody would say, Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini, that's the great triumvirate, that's the devil crowd, and Pope Pius. Mm. Oh, brother, you should have heard them preach. Jesus, oh, why, according to them, the Lord was coming in a few years' time. Second World War came. I went home and waited. Second World War carried on. In 1947, we had our first Pentecostal World Conference. I stopped again to see Brother Wigglesworth. 1948. 47, 48, I saw him. In fact, I had some meetings with him in England then. And again we discussed this. And again he told me some of the miracles. But still, I could not really get enthused about it. You see, the whole thing was not according to my plan. And here, the Pentecostal World Conference, to me, seemed to be God's answer. Now something's going to happen. We Pentecostals will get together and we'll bury the dead old churches. That was my idea. Brother Wilsworth said, no, that's not it. Mm -hmm. The revival will come through the old line denomination. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't know how you're going to get into it, but you get there, the Lord knows how. Mm -hmm. He wasn't worried. In 1949, he died. In 1950, I made my first contacts with the historic church. It was partly just the Lord leading me. 
Dr. John Lejana Mackay, who was president of the International Missionary Council and president of the United Presbyterian Church, president of, of uh, Princeton Seminary, <laughs> he said in a speech in New York, the greatest blessing that has come to Christianity in this century is the Pentecostal movement. I said, that's something for Mackay to say. Because when he worked in South America, he said, the Protestant work in South America is going on fine, except for the fly in the ointment. And the fly is the Pentecostal. And you know what a fly does to the druggist's ointment? It makes it stink. <laughs> and this is the term he used for the Pentecostal. Now, he who said, the Pentecostals in South America was applying the ointment, now says it's the greatest blessing that has come to the church in this century. So I called him. By this time, of course, I was secretary of the Pentecostal World Conference and busy working on the conference in London, 1952. I said, Dr. McGuire, could I meet you somewhere? He says, come to Princeton, have lunch with me. When he heard who I was, he said, yes, I've heard of you and I'd like to talk to you. You come along. And I went to Princeton and had lunch with him and spent the afternoon with him. And that was the beginning of my coming into what we now use to call the ecumenical movement. He told me then, that when I went back to South America and saw what the Holy Spirit had done in the South American and the Latin countries, I concluded that if I had to make a choice, I would rather choose the uncouth life of the Pentecostal than the aesthetic death of the old formal church. <laughs> the formal church. I said, that's wonderful. He said, don't err. Compromise, minimize your Pentecostal life and experience. God has established this movement. And we became friends. I then didn't think I needed to go any further with it. I wait. One day, Bill Wilson, who some of you might know, he is secretary, mission secretary for the Eastern Churches there, came to my home and he said, David, the Lord has sent me through a word of prophecy that came last night in, in uh, East Providence, Rhode Island. We have trouble with missionaries out in, on the East Coast. We have trouble. And uh, the Lord last night said, you can find a way to solve this problem. I couldn't understand the Lord send them to me. I said, why don't you try the evangelicals? Try them. They rejected us. The Lord says, you've got the solution. I said, Bill, the only solution I know now is that I'll have to talk to Dr. Mackay. He's the president of the International Missionary Council. And then perhaps we can do something. He says, David, I don't know what the Lord knows that you can do, but the Lord knows you've got something you can do. I said, all right, you don't mind if I call on the Council of Churches? No. And so then I said to my wife, I'm going to New York. I had contacted Dr. Mackay, and he had made an appointment for me in New York, and I'm going to New York to talk to the World Council people. She said, what are you going to say? I said, I don't know. I'll see when I get there. She said, well, I've listened to you all my life preaching against these councils. Now what are you going to say? I said, might have to apologize. <laughs> I might have to apologize. Oh, I was as faithful as you could find a man if I could. How I enjoyed reading stuff that makes them bad. Because I want them to be bad. I only read the worst stuff about the Catholics because I want to have an excuse to have nothing to do with them. 
You know how easy we can find an excuse that the other crowd's too bad. Don't associate. Come out from among them. And if they are nearly as bad as we think, then we ought to go in and save them. Well, should we? Should we save bad people or are you looking for good people? If you're looking for good people, you're looking for the other fellow's sheep, and I guarantee you'll end up with his goats. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I decided I'll go. And I said, Lord, you've told me to go to these people. And now this issue, Brother Wilson and the Pentecostal missions, is really giving us, giving me a good reason. And I went into New York. And I began to talk and tell them about the Pentecostal missions. Because I had to talk about missions since I had this situation in Kenya, and I think uh, the brethren here also had difficulty those days. In the beginning, they couldn't get recognition from the Council of Churches, and the government, therefore, was cool on them. And uh, the man I talked to, the chief in the office there, finally asked me to keep on telling. Lunch came. Silence sound. I said, it's 12 o'clock and it's time lunchtime. I'm sorry I took so much of your time. He says, no, you didn't take my time. I took yours because I'm asking the questions. He said, do you eat lunch? I said, yes. He says, I'll pay for it. Keep talking. <laughs> so we went and had lunch and I kept talking. Came back and he called the office staff and he made me repeat to the office all those things that I thought they didn't want to hear. I was sure he'd tell me to get out. We're always hurt. So he said to me, where have you been all these days? I said, sir, let me remind you I've only lived in America for a while. I'm a South African. Well, where are your Pentecostal leaders? None of them have ever come and talked to us. We can't get anyone, any of them, anywhere. How do we get a hold of these people? They run away from us. I said, well, you call us Pentecostals crazy fanatic. Who wants to talk to a man that calls you a crazy fanatic? Yeah, I said, it may be true, but you call us unbelieving devils. <laughs> now, I said, that's true, too. But I didn't come here to call you names. He said, that's why I'm not calling you names. I love to hear what you have to say. We are waiting for just such a man. And I stayed there till four o'clock in the afternoon. In fact, I was right in there. For then, they told me to write a letter to them, recommending these Pentecostal moves. And if I remember correctly, it was uh, the Ely Missionary Assemblies and some other group in Pennsylvania, and then Mrs. Gibson's people from the East Coast, uh, Zion Bible Institute. There are three of them. And I recommend that all of them said, these are my brethren, and I know them, honest, trustworthy men, and I would recommend that they get some protection or some help. The office in, London, in uh, New York wrote to London, the London office of the International Missionary Council, later on I got acquainted with those secretaries, they wrote to the British colonial office, for in those days Kenya and those eastern lands were still under British control, and not long afterwards I learned that the British government, the colonial office, had ordered their uh, heads in the colonies to give liberty to these Pentecostals. Thank God for what's happened in East Africa since then. That was the beginning of my cooperating with these people. They gave service. They said, we are not here to control, we are here to serve. I wish every service agency that was ever established remained a service agency. Because we can do with all the service agencies, but God have mercy when service agencies become controlling agencies. That's where the problem starts. When it begins to control instead of serve. Well, now, 
I think for the rest you know the story. Brother Wigglesworth in England told a few brethren that he knew there was a great revival coming. Something I left out when I came here to, in 37. I met Dr. Price, Dr. Charles Price in Pasadena. And we spent an afternoon together. And he wanted to know all about Brother Wigglesworth. They had met. They knew each other. Price was a highly educated man. Wigglesworth was the uneducated man. Wigglesworth would say, I wish I could be like Charles Price. Charles Price said to me, I wish I had no education. I was like Wigglesworth. Then I'd be more spiritual. <clears throat> and I told him then, Brother Wigglesworth predicts that there's a tremendous revival going to sweep the world. The world. Not some countries. The world. And all the church. And dear old Charles Price just burst out in tears. Oh, he said, thank God, thank God, there's someone else got the vision. I said, you got it too? He says, yes, but I dare not talk about it. The brethren all say to me, in the last days the love of many shall wax cold. There is no greater revival. We Pentecostals is the last way. <laughs> the last way. Hmm. No wonder I heard a Pentecostal pastor say, God has made us. What, how did he put it? I've got the word. Now he had a word there. God has made us the holders of the Holy Ghost. If people want it, let them come to us. How sad. You know, when I think of this, I think the Catholic Church must have been Pentecostal. <laughs> because when Pentecostals begin to think they are big church, they're just like Catholics. They're just like Catholics. Now we are the church. I remember the battle we had uh, in, in the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. You know, they used to be the Church of God. And nobody else but they were right. There's still some of them like that. <laughs> There's still some. Well, thank God for shaking us up. Yes. And shaking us out of our old ruts and so on that we've gotten into. But up the price confirmed all that Brother Wigglesworth had said. And these two old pioneers blessed me so. And encouraged me. And so, friends, gradually I came to move easily within church service. It began with mission work, it began with the headquarters, and then they invited me in 1952 to the International Missionary Council in Germany, and there Dr. Mackay did something that's unusual. They never asked visitors to speak. They usually have a program that's lined up but there, he asked me one day, one missionary was telling how our institutions are ruining Christianity. And this is a Methodist missionary. He said that in India, the Methodist church, through a revival that began there years ago, established a school, financed a school. He says today that school has only 10% Christian students and only 5% Christian teachers. And it's still another school. He says the best thing that would happen to us is if we had a successful fire and burned down the place. <laughs> so Dr. McCarry got up and he says, all right, while you fellows are burning down your institutions, I want a gentleman that's with us here to come and tell us how the Pentecostals, without institution, swept around the world with a missionary message that has shaken the world. In those days, that's 1952, that's 18 years ago. That's a long time, you know. But we weren't so strong on education then. Today, oh brother, aren't we doing fine? You can find a doctor on every Pentecostal planet.
I don't know where they get the disease, but uh, some of them have no more warmth than the grease. <laughs> but education then was not. Dr. Mackay said, these people have done it without institutions. Come on, he said, Dr. Duplessis. And then he calls me doctor. <laughs> Somehow it's tough. They sometimes ask me, where'd you get your doctor's degree? I said, I didn't get it. Just Dr. Mackay called me doctor and it's stuck in a conference. I see. Yes, a DD. Oh, yes, I am a DD. A small DD. Stands for David the Donkey. <laughs> That I got in 1920, when I began to work for the Lord. I'm the Lord's donkey, you see. David the donkey was my title in South Africa. You can still find me on that, if you are in South Africa. Well, at that missionary conference, I saw where the churches were going. They asked me, how did the Pentecostals do it? I said, by everyone being a witness, each one teach one. Witnessing, witnessing, being Christians, living the life. And now, today, I hear so often when churches call pastors, they want to know the man's educational qualifications. Missionaries have to have certain qualifications. You can't get out. You've got to pass certain boards. You've got to pass. You even got to pass the carriers now. Lord have mercy upon us if an ungodly psychiatrist fails a spirit-filled man and woman. For how could he understand? And where did he get his information? He gets it from ungodly psychiatrists in other countries. And none of us can fit into that phrase because the natural man receives it, not the things of the spirit. They are forever foolishness to him and they don't want to send fools out to the gospel, <laughs> to these countries. They want clever people. But it's the foolishness of the gospel that has changed these countries. And so today, the Lord has changed things until I can hardly believe it sometimes that I am so at ease and so happy in all kinds of meetings. But thank God for the many brethren that have been willing. I once had to go to a an institute in New York, no, yes, New York, and I couldn't go, so I asked Brother Spencer to go. Here and there I found brethren that are willing to go. In some cases I recommended Pentecostal leaders to go and speak at certain conferences. They got the invitation, absolutely refused to go. But I never refused. I've gone if I can. And sometimes what might hold me back was finances. Or, believe me, there isn't money in this business. If I wanted to make money, I could also have tried to be an evangelist and uh, spend an hour <laughs> raising an offering and preach for half an hour. But I didn't go that way. I do believe the Lord still honors faith. And so he takes care of me. I think of the time now recently when this year he I had to go to Indonesia and I wasn't sure that he wants me to go and here a brother knocks at my door and sits down and gives me a few wonderful scriptures and I said this is just what I need to encourage me on my way to Indonesia oh yes he says but the Lord also gave, told me to give you this and he handed me a thousand dollars that takes care of it not only the promises, but the blessing with it. When I had to go to Chile, just, uh, when was that? May, I had to go to Chile, and I had only two days to speak to a conference of 400 ministers. And I said, Lord, I haven't got time to stay longer. He says, go. I said, Lord, pay all this fair $770 for two days? I'll pay the fare. I had a meeting in Glendale in the Faith Center on a Sunday morning. I spoke there. They already had taken up all the offerings for the day Sunday school and so on. 
When the pastor said, I feel we ought to help Brother David, he's going, he's got a call team to, uh, to uh, Chile, Santiago. Took up an offering. That evening he came and gave me a check. And six hundred dollars. Right. That's great. He said, that's not all. And he gave me another check. Hundred and seventy dollars. Seven hundred and seventy dollars. That's the fair. I said, all right, Lord, if you say that easy, I'll travel easy. <laughs> and I went. Oh, and what a time I had for three days. Stayed three days in Chile. How the Lord blessed. And that's the way he undertakes. That's the way he supplies. And now, tonight I'm leaving. Tomorrow I preach in the Episcopal Church in Selma. On Monday I meet ministers. And uh, then for a few days in a camp meeting in the mountains. Then we fly to Europe. And I'm going, when I was in London in last November, the Catholics invited me, and Brother Ray Brigham was with me that day, and said, will both of you come to a Pentecostal, charismatic, Catholic conference in a university in Salamanca in Spain? Praise the Lord. With the approval of the bishop. We're going to have a Pentecostal conference in Spain. In a Catholic university. Now from there, I am making my first renewal with the Vatican in Rome. Not with the Pope. I am not train. I wrote to the Cardinal, who is president of the Secretariat. Cardinal Villagrán, and they have agreed that they would now like to have dialogue with Pentecostal on September 2 and 3. So I'm going to Rome. Now I know a Catholic priest has said to somebody, David's going to talk to the Pope. I said, then that must be prophetic. But I have made arrangements. If it happens when I get there, all right. Will you pray that the Lord will help me? And let me assure you, the Catholic Church, I know the movement for the last 52 years. I received the baptism in 1918. And my brother, not one, the Pentecostal movement itself, the Protestant churches and so on, nowhere has this revival spot and move so fast as it's moving in Catholic churches now. Throughout the world, it is moving. And everywhere I go, I find people telling me how the Catholic priests and nuns got professors. It's really among their educated and cultured people. Brother Wigglesworth's prophecies, all that he said, is coming true. But the best hasn't happened yet.